Good morning. Welcome to uh, another week, uh, another day, another morning of uh, are these of these digital devotionals of our time together. And as always, I'm so grateful that you're tuning in. It's it's humbling to have you uh, check in to, to what we're studying and, and to hear back from so many of you about the way in which God is speaking and ministering to your heart. Uh, I, as grateful as you are for this, I am grateful for you and I'm humbled by the work that God is doing uh, in us and through us. Uh, we're now to chapter seven of the book of Acts in our lessons together and for now a week, maybe two, we're going to be spending looking at this uh, this event that is is another anchor event in the uh, book of Acts, and this is the the sermon of Stephen and the the fallout, the aftermath of Sir Peter's sermon here. So let's pray, and we'll get into God's word uh, this morning, and uh, be blessed by the things that God's going to teach us and do in us. So let's pray together, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask for a work of your grace and your goodness in our lives and in our hearts, that you would correct us where we are wrong, that you would comfort us where we are hurting, and you would compel us, O oh God, compel us to be those who are so emboldened and so faithful and so, uh, so, so loving and kind and caring as this servant of yours, Stephen. And so would you, uh, would you work in us, Lord, uh, just as you worked in him, that we would uh, be a follower of Jesus and one who makes you known, just as this man, Stephen, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 7, and Stephen, recall, is one of the uh, first uh, class of deacons, the first deacons that are serving the needs of the, the members of the church there in the early church. And and Stephen uh, has uh, gotten into some hot water because he became in, engaged in some disagreements, some arguments, some debate over uh, things of uh, uh, regarding Jesus and the Jewish faith. And so now he's been arrested. And we pick up the uh, unfolding events here in verse 1 of chapter 7. And the high priest said, are these things so? All the accusations. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And God said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them for 40 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, And said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Now, that ends the reading. And this continues on for many, many, many verses. We, we see this go all the way down into verse uh, 53. And it'll take us a while to get there. But I want to introduce to you today a little bit about what is going on in Stephen's sermon and what the Holy Spirit is prompting him to do. Because recall, the accusation against Stephen is that he is being, um, uh, it's being pointed out, it's, it's falsely being pointed out, mind you, that, that he is trying to uh, erode and undermine, undermine the Jewish faith. He's a, you know, Stephen is one who's seen as an aligner uh, with Jesus, and just as Jesus was accused of, of being motivated to destroy the temple, uh, so uh, Stephen is accused in verse 13 that this man never ceases to speak uh, words against this holy place, the temple, and the law, 
For we have heard him say that this uh, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And so they're outraged that he is a threat to their comfort, their stability, their status quo as uh, the Jewish people, which is a total misunderstanding of what Jesus came to do. And so what Stephen does in this uh, sermon is he points out essentially the plan and the purpose that God has been revealing and accomplishing throughout human history that brings forth Jesus Christ as the Messiah Savior. And all the while, the he re- shows how the plan of God is revealed through all these, through Abraham, through my, Isaac, through uh, all these other elements, through, through um, Moses, through the giving of the law. Uh, I mean, all the things that, that uh, God has done through the Old Testament. Stephen essentially is doing Old Testament survey and not only pointing out what God is doing, but how God's people consistently uh, uh, repel and reject and act wickedly against God. And so, uh, essentially, what he's saying then is, by the actions of the Jewish ancestors, it evidences that we need a Savior, that that the promises to Abraham were not fulfilled in Abraham, but in Jesus. The promises and the works of Uh, through Moses were not fulfilled and finished in Moses, but in Jesus. The nation of Israel is not fulfilled in them getting a land and a city and a temple and a law, but it's fulfilled in Jesus. Stephen is going to take many, many verses to get to the point of pointing out that this is all about Jesus. One of the things that really benefits us is when we come to a realization, when we hear and when we accept and we begin to see that all of the Bible, all of God's Word is primarily about Jesus. It involves us very heavily humanity, but we are at best supporting actors in this because it's all about Jesus. It's from the very beginning. God creates to, uh, to make human beings, man and woman, in his image. Still about God, we're the secondary. And then we are to honor and glorify God, but we fall in Adam and Eve, and we're cursed and, and live under the judgment of God. And then all the things that unfold throughout the rest of what we know as the Old Testament isn't just about humanity. It's not just about God being uh, uh, wanting to vindicate his holiness. It is that but it's about bringing forth a savior, a line, a heritage whereby the savior will come to rescue and to redeem and restore humanity. Those that will believe in Jesus, restore them to fellowship with Jesus. That's what Stephen's doing in this sermon. And so here, what Stephen really takes great pains to do is point out that God made a promise to Abraham. He, he, if you re- went back to Genesis chapter 11 and 12 and, and further, you know, Abraham, he's Abram at that time, is living with his father. He's of Ur of Chaldees, and God tells him to leave and go to a land that I will show you. God makes a promise to him in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, that he will, God will bless him and make him a great nation, bless his name and multiply him. There's another promise in Genesis 17 and Genesis 21, 22, these promises that unfold throughout uh, to Abraham. So one of the things that Stephen wants to do, reason why he starts with Abraham, is he wants to make the point that God is a God who makes promises. And not only is God a God who makes promises, but God is a God who keeps his promises. And brothers and sisters, friends, uh, I, I want you to know what God wants you to know is all the promises that God makes in Holy Scripture are fulfilled in Jesus. We need to look no further, no shorter but specifically at Jesus. And in Jesus, we will find all God's promises fulfilled. They become yes and amen in Jesus. And so we need to not turn to God to get things from God. We need to turn to God to trust his son. 
And in trusting his son, we then become beneficiary, beneficiaries. We actually become those that in a sense are written as inheritors of the promises of God. And so God makes these promises to Abraham. And, and he says uh, uh, in the midst of this, all these promises, and yet God spoke this, verse, uh, verse 6, to this, to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in the land belonging to others. Stephen is essentially saying that it shouldn't surprise us that, that our ancestors were sojourners and wanderers. It shouldn't surprise us, as it says in verse 6, that the promise to Abraham that, that they would be enslaved and afflicted for 400 years and that God would judge the nations that they serve. And God said uh, after that that they shall come out and worship me in this place. God, Stephen is pointing out the promises that God makes. One of the best things that you can do is as you turn to Jesus and you begin to stand upon the promises of Jesus to be reminded and immerse yourself in these promises. You know, one of the promises that, that I think uh, is, is most prominent and wonderful and, and encouraging to me uh, comes from uh, Romans chapter 8. And, and I've referred to it in these videos before, but I want to just give you a little sampling, a little nugget of the kind of promises that we find in God's Word. Uh, what, what Paul writes to the Romans, he says in verse 1 of Romans, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ means that we are now condemnation free. We are free from all guilt before the Father. And then going on throughout Romans 8, there's more and more promises. But then he ends with this promise. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every promise that you will encounter in God's Word, in Scripture, in the Bible, it finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And in trusting Jesus, we will begin to then experience the satisfaction and the joy of that promise. So I ask you this morning, do you know Jesus as not only the covenant, or the, the promise maker, but the promise keeper? Do you know Jesus as the great promise keeper and completer? When you do, it changes everything. And that is what Stephen is aiming at here. He is He's not merely trying to refute the air of those making these accusations and charges against him. But Stephen takes this as an opportunity to proclaim the glories of the good news of Jesus Christ. May God enable us to make every take every opportunity and make every effort in every situation and circumstance to be able to point others to Jesus, the great promise keeper. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would enable us to not only see, but to savor and encounter in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of all your promises, the promise of forgiveness, the promise of new life, the promise of redemption, the promise of salvation, the promise of an inheritance, the promise of a, a, a mansion in your glory, a promise of eternity in your presence, a promise of provision and protection, a promise of your power in indwelling by the Holy Spirit, all fulfilled through you, Jesus, our Savior. I pray that you would compel us then as your people to be those to continue to perpetuate and spread and proclaim and make known the, the reality of these promises and call people to faith and trust and dependence in you, Lord, and so to experience eternal life. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. May you know this great promise maker and promise keeper that's pointed to in Stephen's sermon as he directs our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and be with you. And I look forward to being with you again tomorrow. Goodbye.